tonight hundreds of people from all over the world asking questions live. Questions about the weekly parashat, the kiyo, how does it connect me to God, and even more so, what does it have to do with modesty? Do I really need to be modest even though it's not really so popular today? That's the question many ladies need to know the answer to. And even more so, how does this parasha connect to any average person out there when you're saying that the sages teach us that every single verse that's included in the entire Tanakh is something that's relevant to you today, this week, at this time? Why? How can this be proven? Even more so, certain people, before they get me kicked offline and taken off the, uh, the, uh, the feed, ask questions about Palestine, LGBTQ, B. Have you ever heard of the B before? You will tonight. And one guy gets a recommendation to dress up like Pikachu. You want to know why? Stay tuned. You'll be entertained. You'll laugh. And certainly, you'll learn a little bit more about how to be holy. We're uh, back here on our Wednesday night, Stump the Rabbi series, Baruch Hashem, our longest standing series uh, so far, Baruch Hashem. Uh, we're after some Divrei Torah and some relevant things that are happening in the world, uh, things that are certainly happening in people's lives, and uh, of course the weekly parasha. After that, you guys can start asking some questions, and Bezat Hashem will do our best to uh, earn HaKadosh Baruch Hu giving us the answers, Bezat Hashem. Uh, so tonight's show is going to be for the Refua Shlema, for uh, Rabbanit Levana Bat Sarah, Rabbanit Sarah Bat Anat, Rabbi Ephraim Ben Shulamit, uh, Avi Mori David Ben Nesriya, uh, Imi Morati Doris Bat Jora, uh, Gavriel Ben uh, Doris, and uh, all of Am Yisrael, all of the righteous Noahides that continue to learn Torah with us, get closer to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, publicize it, support it, and uh, certainly change our lives Baruch Hashem. so uh, anyone that wants to uh, support the channel support the organization Baruch Hashem, we're a continuously growing organization we have stuff going on all over the world the uh, uh, channels I think we have now uh, in 10 different languages and Baruch Hashem, a lot of people are uh, reaching out uh, now uh, you know in, in many different languages and uh, we're uh, certainly looking to uh, help as many people as possible with whatever tools Hashem gives us so whatever help you give us is uh, certainly going to uh, help many, many more people than ever before. You can go to uh, the website bhtorah.org, uh, or you could donate on the app, or you could donate on uh, Facebook, or you could even donate on uh, YouTube uh, by subscribing to the uh, channel that has a special uh, subscribe uh, thing that um, allows you to give money for it. So obviously, everybody gets the same thing in regards to the videos. But uh, anyone that wants to donate through that terminal could uh, donate through YouTube. Either way, the, uh, there's a lot of good stuff that uh, is in the Torah tonight that, uh, as usual, we're going to try to uncover. Uh, because when you first look at, the, um, at this weekly parasha, you're looking at this Torah portion. You have, uh, this is a week where we have uh, two parashot, two short parashot. You have uh, Vayakel and Pekudeh. Uh, and uh, really we're continuing what Parashat Kitisa started talking about, which is the tabernacle, the Mishkan. And uh, we see really that uh, while the Torah tells us that everything is in the Torah and everything is relevant to us, uh, a person that's new to learning Torah is going to be hard-pressed to find out how this is relevant to him, how is this relevant to her. You're learning about the Mishkan, the tabernacle of the desert. How could this possibly be relevant to you? Uh, you know, here in the year 2023, according to the Gregorian calendar, here in, uh, you know, in the States, here in the, uh, you know, in Europe, here in Israel, wherever here is for you, how could this possibly be relevant to me? And Bezot Hashem, as we do uh, in the way of Kedusha each week in each lecture, as we connect every single part of the Torah to our day-to-day -day lives to make uh, people see how it's divine and not not a uh, human suggestion. It's literally, you have everything is in it. The Gemara, the Talmud Bavli, uh, also known as the Gemara, uh, <clears throat> in the tractate of Megillah, says that Am Yisrael had uh, 55 prophets mentioned in the Tanakh, 
even though we had over 1.2 million prophets throughout the generations. And the reason why only 55 are mentioned in the Tanakh is because the prophecies of the 55, of which 48 were men and 7 were women, uh, those prophecies are relevant to every single generation, to every single person at any given time. Meaning the more you learn each verse, any verse in a Torah, the more you'll see how it's relevant to you, to your life, and even at that particular time. And in fact, one of the uh, most wonderful ways, the most wonderful gifts that HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave me is the insight that you can actually check this out for yourself, where each week you're supposed to learn the weekly Torah portion. And the beautiful part here about the weekly Torah portion, when you're reading it with commentary of the sages and actually understanding what's being said here is that the more you learn it, the more you will actually find solutions and different secrets relevant to your problems during that time. Meaning, you could read this week's parasha, study it, not just read it like the uh, idol worshippers uh, and the heretics read it where they just read things literally. Actually study the parasha, study the commentary of the Jewish sages, at the very least commentary by Rashi or Onkelos, uh, and you'll, um, uh, and Oculus is considered a Targum, even though at times it's really more of a commentary. But needless to say, a, uh, when you actually look at the parasha, you study it, you'll see that you'll find your issues, your questions, your doubts that you have at that time. And then next year, you'll go over to the same exact parasha, but this time you'll see your issues at that time. And your questions and your doubts during that time answered in that parasha. As the Mishnah in Masechet Avot says, Afochba ve'afochba de kulaba. Delve into it and delve into it because everything is in it and literally everything. And so when a person actually goes into the Torah and finds solutions to their day-to-day problems, their business problems, marriage problems, uh, you know, child-rearing problems, uh, whatever problems they have, and they find different solutions in there, uh, that obviously uh, not only shows that the Torah is divine, but also shows that a person is getting a divine gift from Hashem uh, to find those problems. But if a person uh, only has questions but no answers, it simply means that they're not studying, they're not learning. And many times people uh, uh, have a lot of questions uh, that cause them to justify their actions, uh, but the reality is that is not going to be enough in the day of judgment, because Hashem says, okay, I understand you had questions, but why didn't you go into my Torah and look for the answers? And if a person says, no, no, I read it. I read the, uh, you know, the five books of Moses once. I read some parts of the Tanakh and I, 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 I didn't get it. But no one ever said, read it like a storybook. Hashem says, study the Torah. Study the Torah means delve into it and go into the details and try to figure out what's actually being said and who it's being said by. No different than how you are studying your uh, financial statement at this time of the year when you're about to pay taxes or receive a tax refund. No different than when you are reviewing an investment in real estate or in a stock or Bitcoin or anything else. People do a lot of research today because there is a, uh, you know, an endless amount of information in the world and uh, therefore it's very easy access to information. Although there's a lot of falsehood and lies and, uh, and, and corruption, needless to say, there's an endless amount of effort exerted into deciphering what's true and valuable versus what's false and useless uh, and even dangerous at times. So when you're about to make an investment to go buy a new home or buy a new investment property, or you're about to even buy a new computer or a new phone or any new product, usually people spend a more time reviewing and, and researching the product and sometimes even using the product. You know, you'll watch, you know, five, ten different videos about how a certain phone or how a certain motorcycle or how a certain product that you want to buy performs, even if it's as simple as a desk or, or, uh, or a microphone. And, uh, you know, but the reality is that uh, when it comes to the Torah, people think that it's supposed to be given to you on a silver platter as if it's an instant message. So again, Hashem is going to tell a person, if you really wanted the answer, then you would have delved into it no less than you delved into researching your desk and researching your monitor and researching your, your house and the neighborhood and even researching the uh, relationships that you had in the past 20 years ago when they're no longer relevant to you. So a person that invests a lot of time 
uh, into the Torah is going to find the answers. A person that doesn't have answers, it simply means they have not invested a lot of time. So our Holy Torah tells us that we had not only prophets, many of them, but we have specific ones that are mentioned in our Torah, 55 of them, where every single sentence is a prophecy. Every single sentence is relevant to you, to me, to, to everybody out there if you simply delve into it. So how could it be that this uh, building of the Mishkan, uh, these parashot, they're really going to the details is relevant to us. Bezat Hashem, we're going to go into some of those details before we go into the questions. Because I think that this teaching in itself is going to open up a whole new uh, uh, level of questions from some of you that are paying attention. Because you'll see that literally everything is in it. Now, of course, in the beginning of the Parashat, it talks about the Shabbat, it talks about the tabernacle's construction, and what you will notice is that in Parashat Kitisa, when we learned about the, uh, you know, the sin of the uh, golden calf, uh, we see that the Erev Rav, the wicked uh, uh, false converts that, uh, that joined Am Yisrael, uh, ended up enticing Am Yisrael to be part of this uh, golden calf, which until this day we're suffering from. Uh, there were three different levels of, uh, uh, you know, of worship or, or problem or sins, I should say. Uh, one was, you know, some that actually worshipped the golden calf because it actually moved and spoke and even said, I am God. So uh, certainly a, uh, a pretty intimidating uh, statue, not like the ones you buy in the streets. Uh, today it had obviously a certain uh, uh, power that was instilled into it uh, because of the mate that we spoke about last week that uh, came from Moses with the name of God in it uh, similar to the statue of uh, Babel where they had uh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar build a statue that floated in the air uh, some say it was through magnets but it was an enormous statue and the statue spoke so even if uh, they used magnets to make it uh, levitate in the air still that didn't explain how it spoke and said I am God uh, so uh, the uh, Daniel the prophet discovered that it had the uh, name of God uh, you know on his tongue with uh, through some type of uh, uh, mate there as well and uh, that's why he, Daniel uh, asked uh, pretended like he's going to serve this idol also and he asked Nebuchadnezzar to let him climb uh, the statue and kiss it on the lips as a form of worship. Uh, and of course, Nebuchadnezzar was excited to, as, as could possibly be to have Daniel do this because Daniel, in essence, was actually uh, someone that uh, Nebuchadnezzar idolized also. So when, when uh, Daniel climbed this uh, huge, gigantic uh, uh, statue, he got up to the face and he took the, uh, the, uh, the name of God that was inside the mouth of the, uh, of the statue, which silenced it, and uh, he ripped it out with his uh, teeth, and uh, that obviously stopped the whole show. But interestingly enough, Nebuchadnezzar uh, decided to idolize Daniel uh, as, a, as a result of this. But uh, the point being is, is that the idols, when we mention idols, uh, in the Torah, don't think for a moment that all of the idols were the same thing like you buy statues at some sculpture store or, 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 or such. There are certain uh, idols that are mentioned in the Torah actually did have certain powers that were instilled into it through different things, sometimes through uh, a, uh, um, a holy name uh, that was in there and sometimes through Tum'ah, through impurity, uh, which can still be done to this day. Now, the uh, prophets tell us that uh, everything is relevant to us, including this whole parasha. And yet, when we look at the details of the golden calf, we say, okay, it sounds stupid that they worship the golden calf when they have God speaking to them and they could not only hear, but see the sound of his voice. It doesn't sound like a normal thing and therefore there were three types of sins there one that actually served the idol because they were enamored by the fact that it spoke uh there was a uh, a second type of sinner that uh, actually uh didn't speak against it just sat there silently uh which was a, a problem of its own uh, this is actually the majority of the people 
Uh, there are some people that pretended to, to serve it, but really didn't. The point being is, is that you have a, uh, a sin that everybody got uh, in different levels, but uh, even though the majority of Am Yisrael did not serve the idol uh, and bow to it, uh, still everyone got uh, punished, uh, some more than others. Some were killed on the spot when Moshe Rabbeinu came down. Uh, he started killing people. Some people died uh, through a plague. And uh, some people lived, but uh, they had to uh, die in the desert uh, as a result of this and other things that, uh, that happened during the desert. But the point being is, is that you have uh, everyone at fault to some capacity because they were part of it. Either for the reasons that I just mentioned to you or for the mainly the reason of contributing all of the gold that they gave for the statue. Now, if you notice, in Parashat Kitisa, it says that the men ripped off the earrings out of their ears and you know threw it into the fire without considering anything. When was the last time you saw anybody start taking off all of their jewels and diamonds and, 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 and money out of their bank account just for the sake of donating it for any cause? Usually, it doesn't happen. Usually, people are more careful. Usually, people are uh, you know slower to act again it all depends on for what but the point is is that usually people don't just throw all their money into something usually people are you have to convince them sometimes but here we see that Ami said after they hear and see the sound of God they fall into this trap and they throw in a bunch of their gold their wives didn't hence the reason why until this day it's uh, it's uh, it's it says that the teachings are that the ultimate salvation of the Mashiach will come due to the merit of the righteous women. Uh, but the point being is that this still happened. But we don't know how much gold they put. We actually don't know the exact uh, uh, you know, uh, number that each and every single one gave. In the written Torah, we have, in the oral Torah, talks about how the measurements there, which uh, Robert Freim and I did a calculation on, I believe it was a year ago, and it ended up being the same exact uh, number in the Midrash as what Haman uh, gave the 10,000 Kikare Kesef to uh, Achashverosh. Perhaps we'll talk about this uh, at another time. But the point is, is that the Ren Torah doesn't specify the details. But yet, when it comes to the Mishkan, the tabernacle, we have a handful of parashot, one after another, giving us every little bit of detail about how much this and how much that and the measurement of this and the measurement of that. Now, if a person is looking at the law as someone new, then they have no idea how this is relevant to their life. Why do I need to know the measurements of the Aron HaKodesh? Why do I need to know the measurements of the rooms? The measurements and the quantity of all the different things that cover the tabernacle. I mean, what do I need to know all this for? I'm not going to build another one. And anyway, there was the first Bet HaMikdash that was already made of stone and the second Bet HaMikdash. So why do I need to know all these details? How is this relevant to my life? One of the great Chachamim of the previous generations from the uh, um, Rabbeinu Zalman Sorotsky. He actually gives an extraordinary insight into this as well as into human psychology. And he says, when a person wants to make a sin, wants to open up a church for idolatry, wants to run a church, wants to start a uh, pornography website or, in, or, or company, wants to steal money, wants to do something that takes advantage of people, not only will you find that there are always people that are interested in collaborating with this person and take advantage of others, just like unfortunately is happening in the world today, but you'll see that no one questions them until it's too late. You know, Everything looked good until the bank declared bankruptcy in 48 hours. Everything looked great until the energy company declared bankruptcy in literally a few, a few minutes. 
everything looked great until you realize it was all fake and it wasn't didn't become fake that day it didn't become fake even that week it was fake all along whether it was the ponzi scheme of the madoffs and the uh, the people that do the same thing he does or it's the other types of corrupt uh you know uh cryptocurrency exchanges and cryptocurrency itself that were fake from the beginning or it's all of these gurus that pretend like they're going to teach you how to be a millionaire and how to be a billionaire even though they themselves have never become a millionaire or a billionaire from the ideas they preach to people they're only becoming millionaires because of selling people the idea that you could become a millionaire but in reality that they're becoming a millionaire by teaching something they don't know themselves but so in essence the corruption was already from the beginning no one asked this 20 25 year old did you ever check if what you're saying actually works and make millions from it before you start telling us you have a new way to teach did you ever consider having a legitimate exchange and not using it as your own personal piggy bank to fund different lefty liberal activities that you were in fa- a fan of did you ever have an interest in actually investing people's money instead of it being a ponzi scheme did you ever have, have an interest in actually being honest or did you just simply accept the fact that you're a liar and you want it to be that way and the truth is is that many of the scandals started as a scandal ended as a scandal and at times you have certain people started in the right way and then turn it into a scandal but the one common denominator is that all of the evil was unquestioned no one questioned it until it was too late the pornography company the bank robber the 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 the, the thief no one questions it but yet if you have someone that is interested in doing the exact opposite they want to sanctify and glorify the name of God the real God of Israel not some made-up name that people are doing for business not some made-up name and made-up belief that people do for some type of idolatry that will justify their sins but someone wants to build a Torah organization to sanctify Hashem's name to get people closer to Hashem to get people to serve Hashem and not to serve a person not to serve uh, a thing but to serve Hashem all of a sudden says Rav Sarotsky people become critics and auditors everyone all of a sudden has an opinion oh are you sure that uh, there's a interest for uh, this kind of book are you sure that you're not speaking a little too strong to people because you know people are weak so perhaps you have to be a little softer on them who asked you for guidance or advice about how I should speak or how I should write did I ask you did I send you a personalized private uh, 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 exclusive request perhaps maybe with a check asking you dear so-and-so I truly need your guidance and advice of how to speak to the world because surely you must be a master of words even though you've never given a single speech or a single teachings and in fact don't even know what you're talking about even for yourself but I need it did I do it no but yet you see every average person that feels they have a thing or two to say that there are two cents are perhaps not really two cents but really they're a two billion cents they're very valuable and they have an opinion and you know rabbi i think you should teach this you know rabbi i think you should give a lecture about this you know rabbi i think you're too strong on this you know i disagree with what you said about this wait did i ask you did I ask you how and who and for training or anything no and this is not just for me this is this is a common denominator throughout all of history where anyone that wants to go and sanctify Hashem's name you will see the critics suddenly come out of the ground like worms and they all have an opinion wait 
You have an opinion about our, how we run our organization. What, you think we're giving too much money out to help the poor? We should keep some money for ourselves. Oh, I should buy a house because I rent my house and therefore you think I should own a house and instead of me renting a house, I should just take people's donations, pretend like I'm giving it to poor people and then do what you said, buy a house because it's a good investment. Oh, wow. You're a thief and you want me to be a thief like you? Ah, okay, I got you. No, no, we're not. Oh. So wait, at which point during this day did I ask you to come tell me how to run our organization and in fact at which point during your lifetime did you come up with the idea that you are qualified to give this type of idea do you run an organization do you have any experience running organizations helping people do you even care about anybody other than yourself and generally speaking you know the conversation ends pretty quickly because the answers are usually they have no idea what they're talking about but nonetheless this is what happens in the world anytime you want to help sanctify Hashem's name do something good for the sake of goodness critics show up the thief no one criticizes the corrupt politician no one even looks at the corrupt company no one even imagines they could ever even throw a banana outside of a garbage pail everything they must be doing is good because they're successful so it must be good and the reality is people all of a sudden do another role which is also become an auditor what auditor they start telling you listen i think that uh really um there's some mistake going on oh well what's what's the mistake well you said that you're gonna donate uh dollars on Pesach uh, to these people right but you showed a receipt that showed 248,990 so what happened to the other like you know thousand dollars approximately well actually I have the right I have the exact number if you if you really if I could show you no I, I can do the math it's okay I don't need you to show me the number what happened with the thousand dollars yeah like did you guys did you just keep that for yourself is that like how how you make a living because you know you don't work like a regular job right so is that how you make your money like you you, you got that thousand dollars for yourself or did that just not go somewhere and you think to yourself like wait a minute so you have 24 hours in a day and you have decided to allocate I don't know probably a certain amount of time a half hour an hour to think about this question to analyze these numbers in order to go and ask me this very important question of how come we advertise 250,000 that's being given to poor people and the receipt that we showed out of our own simply uh, uh, interest of showing it not necessarily that anybody requested showed that it's a thousand dollars short or to be exact a thousand and ten so you're asking maybe that's how I that's how I live in a mansion and I have uh, Ferraris and and and, and you know all, all the billions that I have stored in, in 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 my storage house next to the horses and the uh and the gold bars that's how that's how I got it from that thousand dollars years when did you become an auditor and this Rabotai is common and Rav Sorotsky says why don't they ask the Enrons, the world comes, the global crossings, which for some some of you are probably foreign names, but these are multi-billion dollar companies that cheated their investors, their customers, and anyone in between for years without anyone even beeping at them until it was too late. Why didn't anybody ask them questions? Why didn't anybody ask the major banking companies that suddenly from one day to the next one day they told you everything is great the next day they told you wait uh we have some material uh, uh issues with our financial reporting for the last two years which uh could very well uh deem the organization worthless excuse me you have something in what why didn't you tell this two years ago where were how did this all happen 
No one asked them. Major companies, Jewish or otherwise, they've done studies on companies and nonprofit organizations where they literally, there's reports out there you can find, I believe even for free, that show that your average multi billion dollar nonprofit organization that pays millions of dollars to the executives running it, nearly 90 cents out of every dollar is actually given to people that have nothing to do with the cause meaning you donate a hundred dollars at best ten dollars actually goes to the cause while the other 90 goes to line people's pockets but nobody questions them no one stops donating to them but yet if a person is trying to build the yeshiva or trying to build a something to sanctify Hashem's name you see that many people all of a sudden have a question a lot of questions of how this and how that now of course to answer that first question that i mentioned before with the two hundred fifty thousand and a thousand dollars of course there was a following receipt that we also had and showed that even more than what uh, we collected we ended up giving so this satisfied this uh this auditor which was really not an auditor it was just an annoying person that didn't even donate but nonetheless these types of things happen why do they happen says Rav Sarotsky, that if you have bad on your mind evil on your mind then the yetzerah the evil inclination is your partner and he's going to help you by simply blinding everybody else's eyes from seeing what you're doing in fact even give you some partners and co-conspirators to help you to help your cause to cheat to defraud to lie to create a bigger havoc and damage in the world but if you're prob- probably trying to do your best to do good in the world and sanctify Hashem's name then of course this is the atomic bomb against the Yetzirah against the Satan and he's going to do everything possible to stop you to put something in your way to discourage you to weaken you so he's going to send you a bunch of people to just annoy you get in your way slow you down and this is actually one of the things we learn from this parasha why because we see that the golden calf idolatry no one questions christianity people simply accept the lie to be a true everyone knows that there are literal mistakes in the new testament but yet 2.8 billion people accept it as if it's true over 30 percent of world population follows christianity in some form or another more than any other religion even more than islam despite the fact that even christian scholars admit the fact that there are serious mistakes that are simply unanswerable such as wrong addresses wrong dates wrong names but yet over 30 percent of war of the world accepts this to be true you have the Me'arat HaMachpelah, the Kiv Machpelah in the wrong place, which you can verify with your own eyes because it still exists. You have problems with verses. You have proven corruption of the actual scripture itself, but yet people accept it. You have archaeological evidence that shows you it's false, but yet people believe it to be true not very different than Islam which has obviously as I've mentioned before many mistakes in it as well things that could have never happened such as the fact of saying that Jesus was the uh, uh, nephew of Moses even though there was a thousand years apart and Miriam the, uh, the mother of Jesus was not the sister of Moshe they lived again a thousand years apart Miriam died in the desert along with Aaron and uh, and Moshe but yet over two billion people believe the Quran as if it's the Word of God even though it has mistakes that are simply unanswerable you don't need there to be any more mistakes for you to simply throw the whole thing into never never land you don't need to find a mistake in every page even though you can you don't need to why once you have a single mistake 
it's no longer divine. Now, of course, people will say, yeah, but the Torah is also uh, has mistakes. No, the Torah doesn't have mistakes. In fact, the Torah cannot have mistakes in it actually proving any other religion to be true. Meaning the only hope that a person can have if they're trying to go against the Torah is by saying, okay, the Torah would have a mistake and therefore there is no God. But that's obviously stupid and easily provable that to be otherwise because the God of Israel is very much real and you could literally see it in the creation. But needless to say, a person is going to question Judaism, but not Islam. Question Judaism, but not Christianity. Why? Because the lie is like garbage. And the garbage attracts all the flies. Attracts all the things that want easy. So a person that doesn't study, a person that's not willing to change their life, a person that's not willing to be a servant of God, is going to be like a fly to falsehood. A person that wants to serve God, is going to have a much harder time at first. Why? Because they're climbing a mountain. And there's constantly going to be different messengers of the Satan. They're going to try to slow him down, slow her down. Oh, don't do this and don't do that. So here we see that if you're planning on being a servant of God and you're planning on living in heaven forever and you only want good forever, don't expect it to be easy. It won't. It's not supposed to be. Now, on the other hand, if somebody else's evil path seems to be easy, don't believe the hype. He's stealing, he's in a cash advance business, robbing people of high interest loans, taking advantage of all types of corrupt legal policies, taking advantage of the weakness of of society, of people's ignorance people stealing, people committing adultery, people are portraying themselves as if they are servants of God, even though they're preaching idolatry, and in reality, they don't even care about the idolatry, they care about all the money that comes along with it. And instead of publicizing even their false cause, all they do is simply publicize themselves in every single paper in order for you to give them more money, buy them another plane, For some reason, they feel like they need five private jets because one is not enough. So a person that sees that, don't believe that just because they're successful, therefore, they're going in the right path. Because first and foremost, you should also always know that there is more behind the scenes that you don't see. And number two, always know that the Satan, part of his job is to give the illusion that evil is good. The other thing that we learn in the parasha is divine love. What is divine love? Now, of course, we can go into a whole lecture about just this. We're going to try to cut it short, maybe try to keep it to about 15 or 20 minutes before you guys start asking questions. Again, I will try. It may not succeed in only being 15 or 20 minutes. But we see that in chapter 38 of Parashat Vayekil, in the book of Exodus, One of the tools that was used in the Mishkan and also in the Bet HaMikdash was the Kiyol. Where did this Kiyol come from? Hashem says to Moshe Rabbeinu to make a laver of copper, a Kiyol. And this came from the mirrors of the women. Now this brings up multiple questions. First question is, if you notice, many of the things that were in this Mishkan, this tabernacle, were gold, silver. Why is this copper? I mean, it wasn't like we had a shortage of gold. There was an abundance. Why not make it out of gold too? Second question is, the donors to make this kyo were women. Why did the men get involved? In fact, why did the fact that the women donate make it even more special? 
last but not least this enormous amount of copper that the women donated was made into a keel why weren't they if they're already gonna donate this why not use it for something else make a table out of it make a, I don't know something else the Evan Ezra says that the women when we were in Egypt would beautify themselves daily just like Ishmael does meaning just like the nations do and the same case is until today women care about their looks and beautify themselves and one of the things that they used is as a tool to help themselves beautify themselves is a mirror but in those days they didn't have the mirrors of today they had these very very shiny pieces of copper that they used as mirrors and of course this reflected gave them a clear uh image of themselves and they were able to fix themselves fix their hat fix their head covering fix whatever makeup whatever they needed to beautify themselves now since this type of thing this type of tool a mirror could easily lead to sins where a woman could beautify herself in a inappropriate way meaning instead of being attractive she wants to be attracting she doesn't just want to be beautiful for her husband she wants to be beautiful for the clerk at the supermarket and her co-workers and some of the customers and perhaps even her friend from high school that she still talks to from time to time and maybe even the neighbor so this type of tool of a mirror was something that Moshe Rabbeinu hated why because it could lead to immorality it could lead to adultery and he wanted to reject this donation because all the women came and they started donating this one after another and Hashem says to Moshe accept it and build a cure out of it because this is my favorite out of all of the things that are in the tabernacle all of the things that are in the, in the Mishkan this is my favorite meaning this keel that you're gonna make from the women's mirrors is more of my favorite than the cherubs the Arona Kodesh the altar the menorah this kiyor is my favorite Hashem says why why is this Hashem's favorite says the Evan Ezra because the daughters of Israel use these mirrors not to be immoral and to be immodest but the opposite when we were suffering the Holocaust for over a century in Egypt 116 years of hardcore slavery the world has never seen not before or after many people lost their desire to live now you could fight in multiple ways if you don't give up fight by just staying alive or you could do what the women did fight by creating a life and what the women would do is knowing that their husband came from a long endless day of slavery and of course does not have any interest or energy or anything in order to bring another child to the world needless to say to any type of physical activity the women knew this but they also knew that the way to win the war is by bringing more children to the world keeping the Jewish people alive so as soon as the husband would come home he would see his wife all beautiful all with makeup yet modest and prepared for him and then she would show him himself in the mirror and she would say to him look at you look how much of a mess you look like but then look at me how beautiful I am oh let's look at you again look you're a mess but I'm beautiful and this was all with not an insulting manner but rather to entice him to see how beautiful his modest wife is and 
create a desire for him to want to build a family and Hashem says these righteous women brought many Jewish children to the world even while they were in Egypt and therefore I want you to take these mirrors that they're donating because they realize that they no longer need to use this trick because now they're free but yet this is a major sacrifice for them that they're giving this because this is going to be made into a kyo this kyo is going to be used either to fix a marriage or end a life why because the water from this kyo will be given to drink but to any wayward woman that's suspected of cheating on her husband of committing adultery she has to drink the water from this this water will also have the name of God in it as well because they're gonna the Kohen will write the name of God on there on a uh, scroll and then dip it into the water the ink will uh, go into the water and this whole process that's mentioned in Parashat Naso is what she has to drink if she did not cheat she did not lie to her husband she did not commit adultery she'll be blessed with children if she already has children she'll have even more she'll have any good blessing she wants if she has ugly children her new children will be beautiful if she has stupid children her children will be smart literally everything that's negative in her life will turn into positive but if she did cheat she did lie she did commit adultery then as a result of drinking that water she will blow up and die on the spot and this will at least end that sin and the marriage and sanctify God's name so I want you to take this these mirrors and make this special keel out of it the Rosh the Baal Turim, who would say it said that he wrote the Baal Turim in a single night as a gift to his father because he was so poor that he did not have money to buy his father a Mishloch Manot so he wrote the Baal Turim, which is an extraordinary work of genius that you can't even do with a computer needless to say in a single night or even in a single year but he did and he does something really extraordinary where he shows how every word that's repeated in the Torah in Tai Tanakh is connected to each other meaning there's no way that Hashem used the same word more than once in a Tanakh for no reason they're always connected and he says what we see here is that Hashem calls the mirrors marot atzvot, the, the colorful mirrors. In the book of Genesis, it also says marot. But it says marot alayla. The it's same word, but what you see at night, the appearance of something that's at night. In the book of Ezekiel, by the way, this was in Genesis chapter 6, verse 2. Then in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 8, verse 3, and also chapter 40, verse 2, Ezekiel says, Marot Elohim, the appearance of God. So the Rosh says this shows that as a result of abandoning these Marot, these uh, mirrors, because they could lead to immoral sins at night Hashem gifted those women with the Shekhinah resting upon them because these women abandoned the desires of this world and gave their mirrors to the Mishkan and as a result the spirit of Hashem the Shekhinah rested upon them and as Robert Ephraim says they knew the secret of using beauty in a modest way in order to create kedusha in the home 
instead of using their beauty that Hashem gave them in an immodest way and creating sins and said to themselves that since we're out of Egypt we don't need to use this trick anymore it's best to simply give it to the Mishkan so we don't even think about sins because Hashem gifts beauty to women and they can use that beauty in a modest way or immodest way if she takes the beauty that Hashem gave her and makes sure that it's designated for her husband or her husband alone while she's at work while she's in the streets while she's shopping she's always covered she's again attractive but not attracting she covers her body she doesn't wear things that are tight she doesn't wear things that define her body or give show the definition of her body she covers herself so people see a classy married woman on the other hand a woman can do the exact opposite and do what unfortunately many women do which is the exact opposite at home she wears pajamas and perhaps looks like she just woke up 24 hours a day but if she goes to the supermarket or work or some type of meeting even if the meeting is with the gardener or the pool guy suddenly she wears her most elaborate fancy and exotic uh, wares why because she wants to be attracting she wants the guy to remember her and think about her even if he's married and even if he's in a marriage act this is a wicked woman now Yonatan ben Uziel says these women brought tzaddikim to the world because as a result of having this gift this divine love that they expressed to Hashem and Hashem giving back to them the Shekhinah they would go to the Mishkan they would go to the opening of the Mishkan at the gate they'd start praying to Hashem and then when they would be with their husband they would have children that would tzaddikim the greatest sages of the generation came from these women and the kyo was the one thing in the tabernacle that did not have measurements and the reason why is because Hashem knew that this is a big sacrifice for these women to give their beautiful mirrors they still had mirrors they still had things to use but not this one not this expensive beautiful one with a history why because Hashem wanted to take all of them because he knew that it was a sacrifice and he did not want any woman that wants to already got to the point of making such a big sacrifice to be rejected so he said there's no measurement for this keel as much as they give you that's how big you build it now when it comes to modesty many women that first hear about it they say well that may be relevant a hundred years ago but it's not relevant today that's a mistake to think number one that it's not relevant today but it's even a bigger mistake to think that women only started becoming not modest today in fact immodesty has always been around since the beginning of time whether it's the parashat noach that talks about the immorality of that day or <coughs> sodom and gomorrah or the women of egypt <coughs> the well known for their immodesty and needless to say for their lesbianism lesbianism was not a new creation either lgbtq is ancient there's nothing new about it in fact there are even the uh Chachamim Dishonim from 900 years ago to talk about people that change their uh their sex organs already from 900 years ago they wrote about Allah do you treat him as a woman now because even though he's a man biologically because he did certain things to change his body surgeries hormones nothing new LGBTQ has nothing new immodesty needless to say in the book of Isaiah the prophet rebukes the women for walking around with very high heels that have bells on them and also on top of certain uh, uh, um, things that were perfumes and stepping on these heels very hard as soon as they walked next to a man in order to get the man's attention because they wanted the men's attention men that weren't their husband men that weren't even Jewish 
And the prophet rebukes them and eventually they get punished severely. Where all of that good smell that they try to get people to notice them turn into bad smell in the most awful places and the most awful punishments that they got eventually. The most embarrassing things, the most horrific things happened to those women. Who were these women? These women were the wives of the leadership at that time. And they would walk around in immodest high heels. Again, nothing new. This is over 2,000 years ago. So when a woman says, oh, immodesty, that, that's, everybody's walks around like that. So therefore, it's okay. There's no such thing. Modesty will always be relevant. Immodesty will, unfortunately, is going to be around until the Mashiach comes and ends it. But until then, you have a choice, either to be a lover of God and thereby accept the divine love you get in return or an enemy of God. Because if you walk around in an immodest way, that means that you're going to be a hazard for society. Every man is going to want to look at you. Even if his wife is right next to them, even if his wife just gave birth and she feels uh, a little bit, uh, uh, sub, you know, subconsciously, she feels a little bit less confident, a little bit further from her husband, and he cares less because he's looking at you. And all those husbands that think that perhaps they need to leave their wife because there, are, there is you and there's other people like you that they believe they can get. All of those sins and much more go to your account. And you become an enemy of God. You become a hazard. So, that's why the Kabbalah responds to women who say, okay, fine, maybe I won't walk around like some of these uh, celebrity women, uh, but uh, still, do you think God really cares about a few inches? A few inches Longer, a few inches shorter. I mean, he has such a big world. You really think he cares about these few inches? So the Kabbalah says that the name Hashem uses for the issues of modesty is Yesod. What is Yesod? Foundation. Anyone that has ever built anything, even if it's Legos or a building or a house, knows with the foundation, you have to be more precise than anything else. Because a foundation that has mistakes in it becomes a tragedy in the making. So yes, in the world of Torah, Hashem does care about every single inch that will either create or destroy modesty. The Sforno says that the tabernacle versus the first and the second Bet Mikdash was something very different as far as Kedusha. Why? You would think that the first Bet Mikdash, this is a huge building, beautiful. King Salmon built it, a lot of holiness in it. The Shekhinah came down in the appearance of a lion. But yet, the tabernacle, Hashem was always there. Meaning, He didn't have to come down. It, there was no, like, He was always there. He was there constantly. In fact, the holiness in the tabernacle that was much simpler, and of course, anyone that heard about the second Bet HaMikdash that was renovated by Herod, that the Gemara says anyone that didn't see the second Bet HaMikdash never saw a beautiful building. That's how beautiful it was before it was destroyed. But yet the Shekhinah wasn't even there. 420 years, no Shekhinah. First Bet HaMikdash had. But even if you combine both of the first and the second Bet HaMikdash, they don't compare to what Moshe Rabbeinu had in the desert. Why? Because the Kadosh Baruch Hu saw that Am Yisrael was constantly doing tshuva and therefore Hashem was in the tabernacle, the Mishkan, more than the first and the second Bet HaMikdash combined, 
Because the way of Hashem is to put Himself where people's hearts and actions are following Him. If you want God to be a constant part of your life, not only are those inches relevant, but everything is relevant. The more of God you want in your life, the more precise you have to be with His laws. And that's why when King David heard from Hashem that he's going to die on a Shabbat, he pleaded with Hashem to give him another day to live so he could die on, on Sunday and be buried on Sunday because you can't bury people on Shabbat. Hashem says, no, on Sunday already is the time for your son, Shlomo, to become a king. And one king cannot go into the kinghood of a second, of another, even if it's your son. It's already precise from heaven okay so you know what take me out of the world a day early on friday hashem says no heaven forbid we do such a thing why because one day of your torah is worth more to me than all of the korbanot all of the sacrifices that your son will make you learning torah is worth more than all of the sacrifices because that learning torah is the true servitude of Hashem. Sacrifices a person could make sometimes only because they have money. Donations are not necessarily always a, a, a symbol of righteousness. But learning and following the Torah, there's no greater servitude than that. So to finalize the point for all of the people that are watching, both ladies and their husbands, if you choose to have more of God in your life and therefore you know that modesty is a prerequisite as Hashem says a woman that's not modest I run away from her that's the pasuk so I don't see a thing of nakedness among you meaning immodesty and run away from you so a woman that's immodest God runs away from you. You want God to be next to you? You want God to be a constant part of your life? Modesty is a prerequisite. But now you're going to say, yeah, but listen, being modest now in this society, in New York, in Brazil, in Australia, in England, in, uh, you know, in London, in uh, Montreal, in Israel, Netanya, whatever, you know, all these different places, everyone says, no, here it's different. Today it's different. And in fact, it's not only the location, still me being modest, covering my body, I'm gonna, you know, people are not gonna think I'm pretty anymore. And I'm not gonna find a husband. Or if I have a husband, he's gonna want he's gonna leave me. And I'm gonna be alone. I'm scared to be alone. And, and, and you know, it's people are gonna make fun of me. These are all the words of the evil inclination, the Satan, that's putting it into your mind that all of these horrible things will happen to you as a result of following the way of God. By being more modest, you think that no one's going to marry you. You think that, you know, no one's going to like you. You think that you're, uh, you know, going to be made fun of. That's what the Yetzirah will tell you. The truth is the opposite, which is, in fact, Modesty, tznyut, creates more beauty, shows more beauty. A woman that's modest is much more beautiful than a woman that's not modest. Same woman, modest versus immodest. Yes, you may have people's sensual craziness in their mind thinking that, oh, this, no one wants to marry the woman that has no arms and no legs because she forgot to wear the sleeves. No one wants to marry the immodest woman. They may want to do all types of sins with them, but they don't want to marry them. Everyone wants to marry the princess that's wearing a gown. Everyone wants to have a family with the princess, with the queen that's wearing a gown. Everyone. That's a reality. So, why? Because again, in one place you see lust, sins, and the other place you see 
mitzvahs, class, righteousness, preservation. So in fact, if you're worried about beauty, whether it's from your husband or from someone in the future, for sure, you'll be much more beautiful with you being more modest. If you're worried that your husband is not going to accept you because he wants you to do this and he wants you to do that and he doesn't like your new modest clothes, stick with the Hashem and you're never going to lose. Why? Because the truth is that once your husband sees that you're standing up for something and he's going to notice you more because you have this modest clothes, as a result, that will actually make your marriage more solid, not less solid. Because when you're immodest, he's constantly going to compare you to everybody else. Why? Because you're immodest, his secretary is immodest, his neighbor is immodest, his competition is immodest, everyone's immodest. So unless you're going to become one of these Hollywood putzot, the reality is you're constantly going to be in competition. But if you are modest, you're no longer in a competition. Why? You are one of a kind. And in his mind, he knows that only he has the rights to see what you look like. Whereas everyone else, they're public property. Everyone gets to see. Last but not least, if you're worried about finding a marriage and so on, one of the greatest gifts that Hashem gives women as a result of following His ways is children. Many women get married and think that children is a given. You have a husband, you have a wife, you have a desire to have kids, you figure you have kids. And many people wake up and realize, whoa, we've been together two, three, four, five years already, no kids. Maybe there's something wrong. They go to the doctor. Doctor says, no, nothing's wrong. So why is that happening? We don't know. Or something sometimes is wrong, but we're not really sure what it is. And year after year passes and everyone's getting older. Everyone's getting sadder. Everyone's getting more frustrated. Everyone's becoming more patient, more impatient. And she feels miserable. And he feels miserable. And the time is passing and no kids. Two years, four years, eight years, ten years, no kids. I've had this literally proven in front of my own eyes countless times where I've advised women to take on modesty. Obviously, keep the mitzvot, keep Shabbat, keep kosher, keep the basics, but specifically make sure you take on modesty. Cover your hair with a hat or scarf and be modest at all times and i've seen this time and time again miracles happen women that were told by doctors they will never have a baby because of this that or the other thing within nine months had a kid i had a woman one time she was single she told me listen i'm older i don't know i'm 40 years old already now you want me to be modest how am I going to find a husband? I haven't found a husband already. I'm 40 years old. Now you want me to be modest? I'm never going to find anybody. I told her, if you listen to a human being, then yeah, you may be right, you may be wrong. But you're not listening to a human being. I'm telling you what Hashem says. Modesty is necessary. You're doing good. You're keeping Shabbat. You're keeping mitzvot. You're giving tzedakah. You're a wonderful person. But you're going to gain home unless you become modest. She got the point. She became modest. Less than five years have passed. She's married. She has a couple of kids. I believe another one on the way. 40 years she lived in this world. At least half of that time she was looking for husbands. Half of that time she wanted to have a kid. Literally it was one of her life's dreams to have a kid. Can't find a husband. Can't find nothing. What does she do? She listens to Hashem becomes modest she was already keeping mitzvot she already did chuba started keep but modesty was tough but modesty is the whole thing it's not just the clothes the way you behave and so on literally within less than five years she found the husband 
The marriage is amazing. They have kids, Baruch Hashem. The doctors are shocked and they have no idea how such a thing could be because technically, according to their calculations, this shouldn't be. That's why Hashem runs the world. And the Gemara says the greatest of doctors goes to Gehenom because he thinks that he becomes a little god. So it's important to know that following the way of Hashem is what Am Yisrael did by building this Mishkan. And if a person takes on the laws of the Torah, the written Torah, the oral Torah, and makes that priority number one in their life, you're guaranteeing yourself that you will win. Ultimately, you will win. That means that despite the difficulties, the ups and downs, the doubts, the confusions, the naysayers, the corruption that surround you, you are on a winning path. Young or old, married or single, doesn't make a difference. You follow the Torah, you can guarantee to win. You don't follow the Torah, you simply become part of the equation. Part of the corruption, part of the lies, part of the adultery, part of the cheating, part of the illusion of the world that makes it seem as if it exists for all these people. All the while Hashem says, no, it's for my chosen people that follow my way. So, this is some of the things that we learned from this week's parasha. There's a lot more we can say, but I know you guys have questions. So, now we're going to have a quick drink and then you guys can start asking some questions. Let's see. Okay, since we have been answering Facebook questions for several years now, we're going to start off and give some of the privileges to our uh, friends on TikTok. Let's see. All right. When was Israel established as a state? If you're talking about the um, modern day Israel, then that's 1948. If you're talking about the land of Israel and, you know, obviously the Jewish people, that was at Mount Sinai. At Mount Sinai, the Torah tells us, is when Hashem made us a people. Uh, that's when Judaism began. Before that, we were Hebrews. Uh, Judaism was not a uh, religion yet, per se, uh, you know, because the Torah is what made us uh, Jewish people. Now, at the same time that Hashem gave us the, uh, the Torah, He also uh, gave us, told us about the promises that He made to us, to our forefathers, to Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, that preceded Mount Sinai. And one of those promises was the land of Israel, which means that God that owns the world, which includes the Jewish people and the non-Jewish people and every single thing that's out there. He creates it. He owns it. He decided that out of the entire planet, there's a certain piece of land that belongs to his chosen people. And that's the Jewish people. So according to God, the owner of the world, that means that the land of Israel has always been the Jewish people's land. Now you, of course, or anybody else out there can refute it, can reject it. You can do whatever you want. You can actually smash your head against the wall a few times. Perhaps your mind will change. But either way, it doesn't change the word of God. God doesn't change. He's not a human. Even Bil'am, the prophet of the Gentiles that lived at the time of Moses, says God is not a man that he would change his mind. He does not lie. So a person, this is in Parashat uh, Balak. You can look over there. And, uh, and a key is to understand that if the creator of the world decided that the land of Israel belongs to the Jews and he doesn't change his mind and he never said that he took it uh, and gave it to someone else, that means that the land belongs to the Jews. Now, you can continue asking the same question over and over again and expect a different result, but I can tell you that even in the world of science, they would uh, simply determine that you and your people are insane uh, for thinking that it would change simply because doing the same thing over and over again expecting it to change is the definition of insanity 
Now, I have told you guys multiple times that there's actually many Palestinians that uh, actually say that the, uh, the Jewish people are not, they're not necessarily their friends, but they're not their enemies like people think. In fact, the enemies are the Arab leaders. Uh, and in fact, there was an article published just a few days ago where the people in Palestine are actually suing the leadership and uh, actually, uh, in essence, ban them or telling people to avoid them, uh, telling people to reject uh, the leaders. Number one, because the leaders have simply taken all of the money that the Palestinian people uh, received from Israeli government, American government, uh, you know, uh, other governments. But in addition to that, they are torturing their own people, meaning the Arab leadership is the worst enemy of the Palestinian people. And the leadership doesn't actually live in Palestine. They already went to Turkey. They went to uh, um, Lebanon. They went to uh, uh, different countries in the Middle East. Some even went to, uh, to England. Uh, but they still run the show. You know, it's like a mafia. So they have a uh, situation now where the people are revolting against their own Palestinian leaders. You can find this on the news. This is not a, something I created out of thin air. And the reality is, is that there is even a nonprofit organization run by a group of uh, people that represent many, many people in the Palestinian community, people that actually live in Palestine, and they interviewed these people, but for the protection of their uh, lives, uh, they hid their identities to a certain extent, Either way, you can find this on the net uh, and you can see these people complaining about not the Jewish people, not the Israeli people, but they're complaining about the horror treatment uh, by the Arab terrorist leaders that they have. So you even have them make statements where they say, even if the Israelis are not my friend, when they were around us, they never bothered us. Whereas Hamas is constantly torturing the people of Palestine, constantly beating them up, throwing, up, throwing them into jails for no reason, uh, killing some of them, impoverishing them, uh, literally destroying lives one after another, forcing people to live in a uh, place where they've turned into some, to look like barracks and, 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 and uh, as if it's under war, uh, shooting missiles against the people of Israel and running away, leaving the people that are living there uh, in, in jeopardy. Why? Because, you know, obviously there's going to be a, uh, uh, you know, missiles hit back, hitting them back. So the point is, is that the Arab leadership is the real enemy of the Palestinian people. Not just because I said it, but because this nonprofit organization that is very well established comprised of many people that actually still live in the area of the Palestinian people, they're not complaining about the Jewish people. Not even once. You can watch, I don't know, this, I don't know they probably have 30, 40, 50 videos, however many videos they have. You can watch them on YouTube, you can watch them on their website. Uh, you'll see. Not a single time do they complain against Israel. Who are they complaining against? The Arab leadership. So you are not aware of that because you either don't care about the truth or you don't actually live in the area in the first place. You're just one of these lefty liberal losers that likes to uh, uh, say things uh, you know nothing about uh, because it sounds right and it sounds liberal and it sounds righteous. Uh, but you should know that the people that are actually living there are not crying foul against the Israelis, but rather against the Arab leadership. So educate yourself at least before you come with more questions and accusations because I will be here to make you look stupid every single time. Be'ezrat Hashem. كيف بتشوفي حل الأزمة اللي أنتوا عايشين فيها حاليا؟ والله حل الأزمة هم يزولوا سيل هم هم 
يمكن تضحك علي لو لو الاسرائيليين موجودين عندنا احسن من حماس بكثير وبمليون مره بس انه هم احتلال بس ما كانوا يتدخلوا فينا في شؤون الداخليه حماس كل شيء بتتدخل لازم غزه تتحرر برضو من اللي عندنا تتحرر مش من الاحتلال احنا تحررنا من الاحتلال بدي غزه تتحرر من الحكومه بتاعت حماس Next question. Uh, let's see. He dodges my questions. I don't know what your question is, so I'm not really sure what question I dodged. Uh, I usually don't really dodge questions. Yeah, not seeing questions right now. Uh, let's see. We support Israel. Thank you. Okay. He thinks we're in. Okay. No, where's the question? Okay, a lot of support messages. Thank you very much. I appreciate all the support, but please... Um, I like the likes and all the hearts and all the little things you guys send me. I, it's wonderful, but I want questions. It's more helpful for people. Um, I support Israel. Okay, support, support. Okay, I'm gonna have to. Uh, there's just one guy that keeps saying that I don't answer his questions, even though he's not asking a question. Oh, here we go. Does Judaism have any special praying methods like Islam? Uh, where do you think Islam learned every custom that they have? Judaism was born at Mount Sinai 3,334 years ago, approximately, more precisely. Islam is a 1400 year old religion which means it's approximately 2000 year difference between the two now the jews and the muslims have lived uh, among each other uh since the beginning and uh before judaism all of the arab people were idol worshippers like the egyptians in fact, before Judaism, the only thing that existed was monotheism of the Hebrews, believing in a single God and whoever followed them, and idolatry. And this is the way it was. It was after Judaism was born, there was Judaism, and then you had idolatry, all forms of idolatry. Idolatry from Egypt, idolatry from different parts of Asia, uh, idolatry of uh, all types of things now then you had christianity another form of idolatry but a uh, an idolatry in disguise uh born which uh initially looked like judaism it looked like judaism so much that uh many confused it with judaism because at first the uh christianity um was a uh started by jews uh that went you know went against and uh, then they obviously recruited a bunch of illiterate uh, poor people that uh, didn't know what to do and how to do it. And they saw this as a system that uh, works for them. And they ended up recruiting a lot of people that were destitute and illiterate and couldn't question the system, that were Gentiles, and, and build it up that way to, uh, you know, to eventually become a significant. But when it became... Uh, what it became today is after the partnership with the Romans, which were idolaters. Now, either way, at this, at this, until Christianity comes along, you only have idolatry of all kinds, and then you have Judaism. Then you have Judaism, idolatry of all kinds, and then the idolatry of Christianity, which is the first 300 years of Christianity. There's a lot of changes, uh, a lot of significant changes. Then you have Islam coming along 600 years later. Islam, being a monotheistic religion, 
believing in a single God, but yet believing in certain things that are heretical or against the Torah. Islam had to get a foundation. Where is this monotheistic foundation comes from? Even your Quran says it comes from the people of the book. It comes from the Torah. So much so that the Quran itself says that if you do not have, uh, you don't you don't know what the word of truth is. You don't know, um, you don't have access to uh, what the, what the truth is. What the uh, uh, Quran says. Go to the Jews. Go to the people of the book. So even the Quran testifies to the fact that the Quran relies on the Torah. Same thing with the New Testament, where although there are parts of the New Testament that are anti-Semitic, where they're calling for the destruction of the Jews, and they're calling them the, the, uh, the synagogue of Satan, and they're also saying that there's only 144,000 Jews uh, will survive the time of the Messiah, all this mumbo-jumbo that the, the, these idol-worshipping leaders say, still at some points you have a uh, even Jesus himself saying that he's not here to change uh, even a yud uh, out of the Torah, meaning that uh, yud is the smallest letter, phys- you know, uh, uh, physically smallest letter out of the entire Hebrew alphabet. It looks like comma, it looks like a comma. He says, even a yud, I won't change from the Torah, meaning the Torah is perfect. Uh, so the point being is, is that there are parts of the New Testament that testify to the fact that uh, the founders of Christianity were very fond uh, and, and very big advocates and believers of the Torah. Obviously things changed and they became enemies, but the point being is, is that uh, the customs and the cultures that you have in uh uh, in both Christianity and uh, Islam are many times they're similar to Judaism that existed before them, that that's where they, in essence, broke off of. They're not similar coincidentally. They're similar because that's the way, that's where they got it from. So I'll give you some examples. They, uh, one of the... Um, things that they do in, uh, uh, in, in Islam is, you know, they pray five times a day. This started with the Jews praying three times a day. And since Islam leaders wanted to compete with the Jews, they wanted the Jews to convert. They wanted to show them that they're more righteous. So they said, oh, you pray three times a day, we'll pray five. We have a, uh, uh, a time during the year where we bow to Hashem during Yom Kippur by going all the way to the ground with the hand and the face all the way to the ground. This today is only done once a year. In the old days, before Islam, this was done every day. But after Islam started doing it on a regular basis, which created different types of problems, the Jewish leaders decided that it is no longer needed for, uh, 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 to do it every single day in order to distinguish ourselves from the Muslim people so people don't think that we're the same. Meaning that it is a constant uh, effort by the Jewish people to distinguish themselves from the non-Jews that are constantly doing things to make themselves look like the Jews. It's not the opposite. Jews are never trying to look like the Goyim if they're trying to serve Hashem. The only times where Jews are looking to look like, like Goyim, you know, which means the nations, not a derogatory word. Even the Jews are considered Goyim. They're considered nations. They're part of the nations. There's in the Torah, it's, uh, Hashem calls everybody Goyim. But when I, when I say Goyim, I'm referring to the nations. If I say Jews and then Goyim, I'm referring to, there's the Jews and there's the rest of the nations. The point being is, is that the, uh, uh, the Jews are never looking to look like the rest of the nations, the rest of the Goyim, if they're serving Hashem. If they're serving themselves, they're looking to become, I don't know, like, uh, like the rest of the people, then obviously they're not serving Hashem. The point being is, is that that... Uh, uh, bowing all the way to the floor, that comes from Judaism. It doesn't come from Islam. Uh, the uh, s- slaughtering the animal, that comes from Judaism. It doesn't come from Islam. Now, the way we slaughter the animal is different than the way the Muslims sla- slaughter the animal. So much so that the Jews, if they slaughter the animal, but according to our definition, that animal does not fit the kosher standards, 
either because there's something with the lung uh, or because the, uh, the, the, the slaughter wasn't in a single act or other different types of precise instructions the butcher did not follow. Now, that animal can be eaten by a Christian that eats whatever moves and whatever doesn't move, but it could also be eaten by the Muslim that needs to also have what's called halal meat, meaning that the kosher meat of the Jews is always halal, and in fact, even the non-kosher meat that was slaughtered by a Jew is considered halal. But the halal meat is never considered kosher for the Jew. So again, slaughtering comes from Judaism. Uh, the uh, uh, that's another part of the religion that's again similar. In uh, in Christianity, there are similarities. Of course, uh, you know there is a thing that's called Ash Wednesday that the Christians have, where a uh, a bunch of them put some dirt on their forehead and they walk around, and everyone that's not Christian. Uh, you know, thinks that they perhaps forgot something on their head and they want to, you know, let me, let me take that off. And, uh, you know, it looks a little funny and silly uh, to people that are not familiar with it, even though it's, uh, for them, it's their religious servitude. Uh, but the truth is that where do they get this from? This is, again, one of the things that the Jews do. As part of mourning, we put ashes on our forehead. As part of mourning, we put ashes on our forehead. That's exactly what we do. So it's not... A Christian creation. This is something that existed since, you know, Judaism existed. When part of mourning is putting ashes on our forehead. Now again, you may not see it every day in the Jewish world because we don't have a special designated day of the year to put ashes on our head. That's one of the things that the Christians created in order to, again, use something uh, they stole from us uh, and, uh, you know, plagiarize from us and in essence make it their own. Uh, so, so they have that, and uh, there are many, many things. In so many words, I can tell you that a large part of the customs and uh, even ways of uh, uh, servitude that the Christians and the Muslims have are things that are similar to Jewish uh, um, uh, actions, uh, and you and usually stem from Jewish actions. I mean, the whole uh, confession. You know, people that go and confess to some priest. Where do you think that comes from? It comes from Judaism. We confess every single day to Hashem. Uh, we confess every day to Hashem that we made mistakes. Uh, we'll do tshuva. But since we believe that we have direct connection to Hashem, while the Christian belief is that you cannot have a direct connection to God, you need somebody in the middle. You need Jesus. You need Mary. You need some priest. You need some pedophile. You need all types of things. We don't have middlemen. We can talk to Hashem whenever we feel like it. Uh, so, so again, the confession part comes from Judaism. It's not a, uh, it's not something that the Christians created. Uh, the um, uh, name a name a name a uh, uh, um, something that the Muslims do or the Christians do, and I could show you uh, easily that uh, this is something that comes from Judaism. Why? Because again, Judaism preceded both of them, and in fact, even the founders of both religions. Um, you know, testified as such. Now, again, this does not mean that they are uh, friends of ours or that they uh, like us, you know, because usually it's just like uh, somebody that, uh, you know, works for you and you help them and you pay them and you feed them and you help them in every way. One day, some, you know, they leave you and they start their own company. And uh, even if they uh, don't say anything against you while they work for you and while you're feeding them, while you're helping them, very often the people that leave end up having uh you know you as a uh, primary target they turn you into an enemy they turn you into a competition even if you don't want to compete with them they turn you into that why that's the nature of people nature of people is to be ungrateful the further a person is from a sham the more ungrateful they are so this is the nature of people and unfortunately this is something that i've experienced quite a bit of in my life uh, where people are uh, naturally ungrateful all the way to the point where Baruch Hashem have uh, already at this point I expect everyone to be ungrateful why? because that's simply the majority of how be- people how they behave they not, are not necessarily ungrateful right from the start usually everything starts in the right path but at some point or another people will express their lack of gratitude and if you ever uh, want to do good for the sake of people don't do good for the sa- you know, to help people uh, if you want something in return 
If you want something in turn, don't do it. Why? Because it's, it's not going to work. If you want to do good for the sake of doing good, because this is part of your role in the world, this is part of serving Hashem, do it. But if you want to do good because you want people to give you credit, you want people to show gratitude, anything like that, don't do it. Why? You're not going to get thank yous. You're not going to get thank yous. You're not going to get, uh, initially, people are going to give you uh, all types of things and, and they love you and I changed my life and all that stuff. But ultimately, expect everything, everybody is like on the, um, uh, you know, the, the, the sand clock. You know, the little grains fall down and there's a little clock and eventually all the sand comes out and you have to turn it around because time ran out. That's in essence, most relationships are like that. Most relationships are like that. And in fact, one thing that you'll see with experience is that the ones you invest the most in are the ones you'll be hurt the most from. Now again, I'm, I'm not trying to discourage you guys from developing relationships with students or teachers or people in general. I'm simply telling you things that you learn with time so you uh, um, have the right expectations at life and don't live through uh, uh, as great of a disappointment because if you have the right expectation, then again, you know, it's never pleasant to be disappointed by people, but it's, it's not as painful when you already don't expect much in return. Now again, there are certain people that are wonderful people, nice people, and so on, but if you are helping people for the sake of a thank you, for the sake of credit, uh, or things like that, you're doing it for the wrong reason. Uh, you'll, you, you know, you're not doing it for the right reason, and, and you're, you're going to end up uh, living a very, very uh, painful life. And again, so you could either listen to me and uh, benefit from my uh, pain, or you can ignore it and suit yourself. Learn from your own pain, by all means. So, so you know, everybody has to obviously make their choices. All right, next question. I'm a gay Jewish man attracted to trans men. I'm in between a rock and a hard place. What should I do? <laughs> If you are looking to follow the ways of God, um, that means that you have to stop acting on your homosexual desires because God says that it's forbidden. It's considered an abomination. And in fact, uh, it is considered no different than bestiality. That's why in the Torah, anytime you see the uh, Torah mention LGBTQ types of behavior, you'll see that the Torah also mentions bestiality. Uh, so perhaps it should be LGBTQ B, because the Torah has the B next to it. Uh, and Hashem calls all of that an abomination, which means disgusting in the eyes of God. Now, if you want to serve your master, your creator, and eventually go to heaven, you must cease any type of LGBTQ B type of behavior. And simply find a female, if you're a male, or male if you're a female, your opposite gender, as a person to marry and build a nice Jewish home. Because you have certain desires, it doesn't mean you need to follow them. And in fact, the average person that uh, learns Torah is not necessarily always going to have a clear mind but you at least know what's the right thing to do and what the wrong is to do. Now, once you decide that you want to do the right thing, you have to figure out how to do it. Now, you can say, listen, I have uh, these desires, but I, uh, you know, I, um, I want to follow the Torah. So, if a person is the typical homosexual male that is attracted to another male, then simply, you have to find one common denominator in the males that you're attracted to, typically, in a female. Which, let's say, for example, you're a feminine male, and you want masculine men, find a masculine female. And there, you buy, you could have a perfectly kosher relationship with a masculine female. And it really shouldn't matter to you what kind of equipment they have. It doesn't make a difference. And then you could have a kosher relationship that is not an abomination in the eyes of God. You're a Jew, you go with a Jewish woman, you're a Gentile, you go with a Gentile woman, no problem. You want a fa feminine woman, find a feminine woman. You want a masculine woman, find a masculine woman. 
Now, the interesting thing here is that you're saying that you are a Jewish man and you're interested in men that pretend to be women which in essence shows that there's a very good possibility that all of your lgbtq desires are simply false desires to simply do what's wrong and rebellious rather than to do what you're actually attracted to and i can assure you that just like multiple students that have helped uh with this if you learn our lectures especially the ones from Pirkei Avot and other Musar that we teach and simply make a commitment to follow the ways of God not only will you eventually uh, uh, have a much easier time to abandon this confusion and these types of desires but you will be like some of my students that tell me literally they no longer have the desires at all they have perfectly normal desires uh, where men have attraction to women, women have attraction to men, and, and, and literally, as if this virus, uh, this spiritual virus was removed from their mind. And the truth be told is that it's, it's important for a person to know that if you are doing things that cause you to constantly express uh, yourself in order to let other people know about what you're doing uh it's you have to ask yourself why why are why is the lgbtq b society so motivated to let everyone in the world know about what's going on in their bedroom or car or garbage pail or whatever they're, they're doing why do i need to know the average person's crazy desires when i didn't ask him about it and this has nothing to do with you this has to do with just to show you the corruption within the mentality ah look at that they removed me every time you mention lgbtq the uh They remove you with your uh, your uh, thing. So anyway, if you notice that if I were here to express my uh, or somebody was here to express their uh, heterosexual relationship no one would really care why what do i care why, why do i need to know what you do with uh, your husband your wife what, what, what difference does it make but yet the lgbtq b walk around with a flag to let the whole world know why do you need to missionize your beliefs what do i care did i ask you why do i need to know about what you do do does it's it's just such a demented thing that's become part of acceptable as part of society that again you have to ask yourself who is behind all of this and i can tell you for sure it is the satan himself because only the satan will want people to accept what was frowned upon and hidden and uh, really uh, considered an abomination by the vast majority of society throughout all of generation and somehow has become normalized now again even if a person uh, you know has strong desires they lose control of themselves that does not mean that you have to share those things uh, and that experience and those decisions with the public you know your average person that is not lgbtq does not go around and tell the whole world about every little banana peel he ever slips on every single relationship he he starts or abandons and quite frankly if he did it no one would care so the people that are part of this lgbtq are trying to make the world care because they're another form of anti-god society uh they're another form of 
enemies of the Torah. They're another form of uh, Amalek that is a uh, 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 trying to create confusion. And anyone that just delves into it and thinks about it long enough will see that regardless of where you stand as far as your feelings, the way that they're practiced doesn't make sense. The way that the society tells you to practice them doesn't make sense. No different than how the Hamas terrorists tell their people to express their uh, their uh, you know fight for freedom by simply killing themselves. Uh, you know, so it's it's a it's important for a person to think deeper about why they do what they do and why they follow certain people that they follow, and they'll see that the ways of Torah always make sense. If you delve into them, you're always going to find an answer. Whereas if you uh, delve into other things, you're never going to find something that makes sense. You'll see one convoluted issue turn into a more convoluted issue and it'll turn into more confusion. And you're always going to see that there is no actual pattern uh, of consistency in any of these false beliefs. The only patterns that you have in them is a pattern of lies. That's the only thing you have. The pattern, you know, the, 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 the Christian sages are mean nothing to the uh, modern Christians of today. The, uh, the uh, uh, Islamic sages are virtually meaningless to the uh, Muslims of today. The uh, uh, people that advocated for all types of LGBTQ types of uh, uh, beliefs are virtually meaningless to your a- average, you know, uh, uh, lust uh, 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 chaser out there. It's, it's just not, it's, they don't have any lineage, they don't have any foundation, they don't have any history, and nothing. They have no connection to the past. They, everyone is simply uh, looking to satisfy their own uh, desires and, 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 uh, and craziness. And the truth is, is that things like this, that don't have longevity, uh, don't have history, don't have longevity. So uh, if a person wants to uh, be something, uh, a part of something that has a consistent uh, truth uh, that uh, creates consistent success, the only way is the way of God. And not any God that people create, but the God of Israel, the Torah, Judaism, and not the uh, the Judaism that people make up uh, because uh, they want to call themselves homosexual and Jewish or uh, you know trans and Jewish or, or reform and Jewish. No, it's, 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 none of these things... Uh, uh, our Judaism. You could put a Jewish next to anything. It doesn't make it Jewish. You know, there was a person that uh, gave a uh, Jewish bar mitzvah to his dog. Just because he called it Jewish bar mitzvah uh, doesn't mean, or bar mitzvah, doesn't mean that Judaism takes any part in this, you know, forsaken act. And if you want Judaism, you have to go with Orthodox Judaism because that's in essence the uh, foundation that we had for the last several thousand years continued. That's it. Orthodox Judaism. Now, there's obviously customs among Orthodox Jews, whether it be the uh, uh, the customs of the Sephardi Jews from Syria or Sephardi Jews from Morocco or Sephardi Jews uh, that are part of uh, Bukhara or Sephardi Jews that are part of uh, Libya or Ashkenazi, Jew, Ashkenazi Jews from Poland or from different parts of uh, Europe uh, uh, or Argentina or different parts of, uh, you know, the, Germany. You know, there's, there's a, uh, Baruch Hashem, lots of different, uh, uh, you know, uh, choices as far as customs. You have the Yemenite customs, Ethiopian customs, uh, Italian customs, uh, Indian customs, uh, Babylonian customs, which is the Iraqi Jews, uh, the Persian customs from Iran. You have, Baruch Hashem, Jews coming from all walks of life from all parts of the uh, world, but the... Uh, common denominator among all of them is that we all have the same exact foundation, the same Shulchan Aruch, the same five books of Moses, the same Gemara and Mishnah, the same, the same foundation. Customs are, you know, the different parts of the culture of the surrounding areas that you live in, whether you live next to uh, Arabs or you live next to different uh, uh, Gentile, you know, Gentiles from, uh, from Europe or, or from Asia or whatever it is. That's, that's, that, those are customs of how you are, uh, are Americans. You know, these are customs. The, the parts that are the most critical, the common denominator throughout the last 3,300 years 
is that the religion itself uh, has a, is the same no matter where you live. And that's why when many people emigrated to what's called modern-day Israel today, uh, from different parts of the world, you saw that the tefillin of Yemen was the same tefillin as what you had from Poland, and the same tefillin as what you had uh, from a uh, uh, um, you know Uzbekistan or or or, uh, or Morocco or Syria or uh, or Libya or Spain or different parts of the world. Everybody had the same tefillin and the same tzitzit. And uh, yes, there were certain customary changes of how many uh, loops you would have, whether you use the shita of the Rambam or use the shita uh, of different Chachamim, but all of us had the same number of strings, the same number of corners. It was all the same. You know, so, so it's, that's, that's, again, it's, it's, it's critical for a person to know that if you are part of Orthodox Judaism, you're going to have that common denominator that will obligate you to be modest and observe Shabbat and be kosher, and, uh, and, and be honest, and, and so on. But uh, if you're going to uh, do things that are against that common denominator, that holy Torah that we have, and just put Jewish next to whatever reformed uh, mentality and behavior you have, whether that reformed is a reformed belief like Christianity, and just call it Messianic Judaism, or it's reformed like the reformed uh, Jews that really have no connection to judaism whatsoever it's literally there's more reformed jews that are not jewish at all than there are jewish reformed or you're going to be the uh you know the uh the uh conservative jewish which is again in so many words means that you know, you're going to simply uh be conservative with your investment into judaism in so many words and just do only a few of the things that the torah actually says and reject a lot of it you know so, sort of like conservative investors in a stock market well they have you know 90 percent of what their holdings are is in bonds but you know they'll delve into uh 10 10 percent into stocks so if the stocks were the uh uh you know the torah and then 90 percent will be the uh the nonsense of uh of uh, of conservative because if that's really what it is that's not judaism it's not judaism and unfortunately it's the same concept with modern modern jew you know modern orthodox all that really means is that you've modernized the law and in, sen- in so many words pick and choose which one of the laws you simply don't want uh just like masoti masoti Arabi again used to say masor is masoti it comes from masor masor like a a um a a, a a saw masor is a saw as if you're cutting mitzvot so it's the same thing with modern orthodox they decided that modesty is no longer an obligation you know, uh, uh, rebuking, no longer obligation. Uh, you know, different Torah commandments are no longer obligatory, and perhaps they're a, a choice. Uh, so again, if you want Judaism, you have to know the difference between what is the halacha, you know, and what is the custom. Halacha is not changeable. The halacha from the Torah is not changeable. It's not something that you can simply just decide that you're not going to do it, but, you know, it's still Jewish. It's, it's 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 simply it's like saying this poisonous food you know it's it, well it's still food no it's poison it's not food it's poison so it's uh there's spiritual poison and there's uh other poison uh, the spiritual poison is more dangerous okay next question uh, could you please explain why the order of the construction of the Mishkan that Betzalel built is different in these parashiot than it was recorded in the parashah of Truma. Um, not following. I mean, as far as far as the uh, the, the Torah is not given in a. Um, I spoke about this last week. The Torah is not written in a uh, uh, order of things happening. Uh, so you know when you when you expect you know you see something written that it happened at this time. And then, uh, you know, another thing happening, uh, let's say, uh, you know, a paragraph later or a different parasha later, it doesn't mean that that thing that was written later happened later. Many times it happened before. So it's, that's why it's important to read the commentary by Rashi uh, and other Chachamim because they explain all of the uh, kushiot, all of the things that uh, could look like contradictions or need uh, clarification and so on. 
uh, can Noahide eat a puffer fish that was prepared by an expert chef? Uh, can they eat it? Uh, yes, they can eat it, but uh, should they eat it is a different story. Uh, the, uh, there's no obligation for a, uh, um, a Noahide to observe kosher laws, and although I know that the, uh, uh, this fish apparently is supposed to be something dangerous, uh, if it's not prepared the right way, the person would die. Uh, I don't believe that there is a Noahide law that forbids a Noahide from taking uh, risks, uh, but that does not mean that they should do it. There is allowed, there's uh, allowed and not recommended, and then there's forbidden. Uh, so, uh, you know, this would be in the allowed and not recommended. And if a person uh, simply treats their life as if it is uh, unimportant and, you know, and take risks, then Hashem may actually agree with them one day and say, you know what, since your life, uh, in your opinion, is not important to the point where you're willing to risk your entire life just to tickle some taste buds on your tongue for a few seconds, then perhaps you are unimportant and just simply remove a person from the world. So again, there's only a certain amount of stupidity that Hashem is willing to tolerate, whether it's from Jews or Gentiles. A person that's willing to risk their entire life, their, their, their uh, relationship with their family, with their loved ones, their, 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 literally their eternity, just for the sake of, of a few taste buds on their, fi- on, on their tongue for, for a few seconds, that's a very stupid person that probably doesn't have uh, you know, much uh, value in the world in the first place. So I wouldn't doubt that this person would die young anyway, even if it's not from the fish. Uh, next, can a Noahide man wear a yarmulke even though he will appear to be a Jew and will also be eating at a non-kosher restaurant? Now, I'm not really sure if you're asking me these questions just because you're looking for every controversial answer or you're just looking to annoy me uh, or you're simply bored out of your mind. But uh, lying is not allowed for anybody. Midvar sheker tirchak. So a Jew is not allowed to lie. A Gentile is also not allowed to lie. So a Gentile that pretends to uh, be Jewish by appearing Jewish is sinning against God uh, and can create a lot of problems for himself uh, and for Jewish people. So certainly that's not allowed. Certainly they shouldn't do it. And uh, again, if they choose to be wicked, then uh, you know that that's, they'll have to suffer the consequences. Uh, question I have a guest over for Shabbos for years he's now comfortable enough to just lift his leg and pass we all pretended we heard nothing and uh, not to embarrass him but to make matters worse after the meal when my uh, wife went upstairs, my little son was on the couch and his back was facing him. He then said to me, I got to... Okay. All right, this is a really long question. It's very disgusting. Uh, if you don't tell people the truth, they're simply never going to have a motivation to change or a reason to change. So um, you have to pull this person aside uh, it's better for you to do it not on Shabbat, do it you know before Shabbat and tell them, listen, what you're doing is not only uh, disgusting uh, and really should create, you know, should, shouldn't be embarrassing for you to do it, uh, but it's also forbidden uh, to do it as a, a person is not supposed to be uh, doing things like that in a place of worship. You know, your place where you're eating your Shabbat dinner, in essence, is part of your servitude of Hashem. Uh, you're not allowed to pray if uh, a person flatulates, you're not allowed to uh, uh, have your tefillin on. Uh, you're not allowed to be next to anything that has a bad smell. You're not even allowed to think of God uh, during t- such things, according to sages. Some sages say that you're not allowed to say the, uh, the name of God or words of Torah when there's bad smell. Uh, but um, uh, certainly uh, there, are, there are some that uh, believe it's even more. You're not allowed to think of God when there is a bad smell. Now, again, he could tell you, no, it doesn't smell, it's just funny. Uh, then they should tell him, listen, you know what? Then you belong in a zoo, because in a zoo, there is no uh, uh, um, you know, 
requirements for you to uh, uh, be classy or, or, or behave like a human. Uh, so you should go and move there. Uh, what they're doing is certainly disgusting and they should be told that this is disgusting and unacceptable and if they're not uh, going to uh, change, then they're not welcome to come back even if it's your uh, uh, whoever it is. doesn't make a difference who it is. It's, it's certainly inappropriate and apparently they have no sense of uh, right and wrong anymore uh, because probably nobody has rebuked them in probably at least uh, 20, 30 years. So... Uh, if you want to volunteer, you can do it. If you're uncomfortable doing it, then write them a letter. Write them a letter, and uh, that sometimes is easier. Um, let's see. If you eat something made with chicken broth or beef broth, but has no other meat, you have to wait six hours uh, before you eat uh, dairy, yeah, I mean, if it's broth, it was part. It's, it has. It's considered as if it has meat. I mean, unless it's just flavoring. Unless it's just flavoring, it's not actual. Didn't get it from the meat itself. It's just flavoring. Like they put certain uh, flavoring that tastes like meat, like they do with tofu. Uh, you know, if you eat tofu, uh, uh, you know, it could taste like whatever you want. You could. Uh, Real tofu is tasteless, but you can make it taste like whatever you want. You can make it taste like lobster. You can make it taste like, uh, uh, you know, uh, steak. You can make it taste like whatever you want. That is not a problem for you to eat, you know, the tofu with taste of uh, meat with cheese together. There's no problem. Uh, you know, and thereby there's many kosher restaurants that sell this stuff. Sell, you know, the, uh, uh, the soy burgers. You know, it's a soy uh, but uh, it's a burger, but they put cheese on it. And there's no problem with that uh, as far as uh, kashrut is concerned. It's certainly not a uh, good idea to train your, your kids to, that this is acceptable uh, because, again, they may think that you know, the real one also is acceptable later on. But the point being is as far as kosher is concerned, it's perfectly allowed. Now, as far as if the, uh, what you have is just simply flavoring, there's no problem. But if it's actually coming from a chicken or from a, uh, uh, a piece of meat, then of course it's considered meat 100%, even if you don't have a, uh, you know, an ounce of meat in there. It doesn't make a difference. It's still, not, it's still considered meat. Um, what parent Aileen, can a woman say during pregnancy? Uh, during pregnancy, you could say all Taylim. There are... Uh, certain Taylim that uh, a woman should say at specific times of her life. Uh, you know, specific ones. Uh, if you're pregnant, it depends on what stage of pregnancy you're at. If it's the early stages of, of pregnancy or the later stages of pregnancy. If it's said by the husband or it's said by the wife. Uh, there are some, some stages, uh, specifically Mekubalim, uh, designated specific ones at specific times. Uh, but generally speaking, you could always say all Taylim at any time, uh, and they're all acceptable. Uh, if a person wants to be more specific, uh, because they have a very limited amount of time, let's say they only have 10 minutes a day to, to do it, uh, then they could be more specific. But if, you know, a woman uh, has all day, uh, and uh, then she should read the entire book of Taylim, or at least uh, half of it, or a quarter of it, and, you know, starts with, you know, uh, with number one, gets to, let's say, number 30. Then the next day, from 31 to, you know, 60. And then from, you know, the next day, from 61 to 90, and so on and so forth. And finish the whole book of Tilim at least once a week. Uh, that would be fantastic. Or, you know, once a month even. It's, 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 good, it's good also. But the point is that you could do this every day, uh, read Tilim. Uh, especially if, you know, average person that has... More than just a few minutes. But if a person is very, very specific and uh, very particular or they have a very particular problem or they have a very limited amount of time, then they could, uh, you know, use some of the, what the uh, Makubalim have taught, which is to be specific with prayers. I've shown some people uh, some of these prayers in the past. But again, it's a, uh, this does not mean that uh, they're the only Teilim that are good. Similar to the Tikkun Klali. Tikkun Klali, many people are confused about Tikkun Klali. That Rabbi Nachman of Breslev, uh, I know, uh, uh, let the world know about, as if Tikkun Klali is either the only Teilim out there 
or it's the actual tshuva. Tikuna klali is not the actual tshuva. Tikuna klali is some is a certain set of teilim that are supposed to uh, cause your heart to be inspired to do tshuva. It's not tshuva itself. It's supposed to encourage a person and and and, and uh, in essence a uh, light up his soul to want to do tshuva, which is the practical parts, which is stop sinning, commit to not sinning, be remorseful. Uh, pass the test, that's tshuva. Tshuva is the same across the board. Those tehillim are supposed to inspire a person to do tshuva. They're not actual tshuva. Many people think that if they read the tikkuna klali or any other set of tefillin, then they're fixed. No, you're not fixed. It's, 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 you, know, you have to do the actual tshuva. And a tshuva is much more than just reading uh, tehillim. You have to do uh, the actual action itself of learning uh, about uh, what's right, what's wrong, what's allowed, what's not allowed, and so on and so forth. Uh, question. Would it be accurate to say that there are levels of immodesty for women? Is Hashem's equality upset at someone that is somewhat immodest than someone that looks like an outright putza? Uh, well, I mean, they both go to Genom. Whether they're somewhat immodest or they're very immodest, they still go to Gainom. Uh, which chamber they go to, what division and what fire is used on them, you know, again, that, uh, that's going to be decided in heaven but, uh, or Gainom. Uh, but uh, as far as uh, if a woman, let's say, for example, she, uh, this is actually a common thing apparently, it's like a little, it's like a skin disease among the people where women like the headscarves they wear a headscarf which is biblical obligation fantastic you're covering your hair with a with a scarf great job until you see the rest of this person which is they're wearing a t-shirt meaning they're not covering their arms and they're wearing a short skirt now this woman thinks oh yeah i'm following along covering my hair Yes, you're covering your hair so your head will not be burned in Gehenom. The rest of you will be. Why? Because you're not modest. You're not modest. That's also a biblical obligation. To walk around with a t-shirt or, or tight skirt, tight pants, short skirt, short pants is forbidden according to all opinions. So as far as uh, does she get credit for covering her hair? Yes. Yes, she definitely will get credit for covering her hair. Does that mean that she will go to heaven because of that? No, she will go to Ganom first uh, because of what happened with the rest of her body. The head is connected to the rest of the body. Unless she wants to just simply chop off her head and just be like a little, you know, connected to like, you know, one of those like uh, uh, comic books fantasies where there's like a head connected to some type of chair, like it's a robot. You know, it's like a robot head and it just walks around and it's covered, but it, you know, so there's no body. Then perhaps the whole, you know, the whole head will go to heaven without going to Ganom. Uh, because, you know, the body that's not modest is not connected to her anymore. But if she wants her whole thing, like the whole package to go to heaven, uh, then the rest, the whole body has to be, uh, uh, the whole body has to be modest. You know, it's, it's, it's the opposite of what Rabbi again, Allah wa Shalom used to say to women, you know, don't let the rabbis fool you about covering your head. You only have to cover your head if you have a head. But if you don't have a head, you don't have to cover your head. <laughs> so, so if a woman wants to uh, uh, have a head, she has to cover it if she's married. Uh, but uh, if she doesn't have a head, then she doesn't have to cover the head. Hashem uh, doesn't obligate you to do things that you can't do. Again, we make light of it, uh, in, but in, in reality, it's a very significant thing. So, somewhat immodest, I don't know what your definition of somewhat immodest is. I know that 99% truth is 100% lie. That does not mean that anytime someone is not 100% modest, we start beating them up with sticks and we hate them. No, 
We love everybody. We try to help everybody. And we know that people sometimes will have to grow over time uh, rather than just jump full board into becoming the most righteous person on day one. We're very well aware of it. We're very conscious of it. We lived it ourselves. And again, it's a process. But that does not mean that it's okay to be somewhat doing anything. The wrong, the sin is never right, is never allowed. It does not mean that everyone is either going to be all or nothing. No, they're going to do whatever they can and all, and, and you've got to encourage them to continue growing, but always know that they have to grow and wherever they are right now is perhaps the best they can do. So it's good, but you're not finished. You have to do more. It's never going to be okay for a married woman to walk around without covering her hair. It's never going to be okay for her to walk around immodest. It's never going to be okay for someone to eat non-kosher. It's never going to be okay to steal. It's never going to be okay to observe only part of Shabbat. That's never okay. Now, does that mean that it's either you do everything or don't do anything? No. Minimize the sins and grow, but... The key is to never justify the wrong. Never just say, okay, you know what? Hashem is going to understand me just the way I am. No, he's not going to understand you the way you are. He's going to punish you. He's, he's giving you the time and his understanding of your weakness is continuing to give you life while you're not perfect, while you're not even trying to be perfect. So he's understanding you while you're still alive. But if you think you're going to go up to uh, the bed dean of heaven and simply just tell him, listen, Ah, it's the best I can do. Just put me in heaven. Come on, I'm a, I'm a pretty nice guy. I'm a pretty nice lady. You know, I, I tried my best, uh, and uh, you know, even though uh, I, I could have done better, it's just, just you know, come on, just give me a pass. No such thing. There is no such thing as give you a pass. Anyone that says that Hashem will just give you a pass gets a special punishment on top of whatever that punishment is, which is intestinal problems, and special session in game where they cut them up into little pieces, and you probably don't know what about it. Don't want to know that part. But yeah, so again, it's reality is people will have to go through growing stages. There are some people that I talk to and, and, and the, in the beginning, even putting on a kippah is difficult for them. Even saying Shema Yisrael is difficult for them. Even uh, praying every day is difficult for them. Does that mean we reject them? Does that mean we frown upon them? Does that mean we make fun of them? No, absolutely not. What do you think? I only talk to religious people? 90% of the people that I talk to are not religious at all. And I, Boch Hashem, over time, I get them there. You know, to the best of my ability, as long as they're willing to invest the time and the effort, they get there. But the point is, is that at first, people, you know, walk from all walks of life. They come and ask questions, and, you know, if they're, if they're really looking to change, they eventually do. But one thing that people know from day one is that you're always going to hear the same exact answer, which is the truth. Allowed, not allowed. It's, again, even if you don't follow everything, that does not mean that it's okay. It doesn't mean that you should give up on everything, but it doesn't mean that it's okay either. You have to grow. The same concept goes for everything else in life. And I think that uh, if you're consistent with the truth, people will be much more uh, um, uh, conscious of it, and uh, they're also going to uh, be much more uh, you know, likely to follow it because it's something that doesn't change. It's like uh, uh, evergreen. You know, uh, whereas if you customize things to different people and you change, then in essence, you change the Torah, then you simply confuse people and, and end up uh, getting them to simply do, do nothing or do less than what they would have done otherwise. So it's better not to do that. It's better to just simply tell people the truth and obviously work with uh, what you have and little by little encourage them to continue growing and visit the you succeed. Can you elaborate on the specifics of not being allowed to pray or learn Torah if you have to use the restroom and being unclean? And is the difference for Jews and non-Jews? Specifically, what's the di- what is the... Hold on. What is the having to go? Okay, so as far as the... Uh, this is specifically for Jews. That's the halacha is for Jews. It's not for non-Jews. Certainly, it's good recommendation for non-Jews, but it's not obligation for non-Jews. 
Um, which is if a person has to go to the bathroom, whether it's number one or number two, uh, and they don't believe that they can contain themselves for longer than 72 minutes, which is an hour and 12 minutes, uh, you know, meaning that they will have to go and relieve themselves within 72 minutes, that means that they're at that point uh, forbidden from praying or, or doing anything. They have to go to the bathroom. Now the sages say you shouldn't even wait one minute. You should go right away. Uh, one of the sages said that uh, if I have to go, even if I'm in the middle of a speech and there's no way for me to go, I'll simply get one of my uh, students to bring something to block me from the crowd and I'll literally uh, you know, uh, uh, urinate right there and there because you could uh, create a major health problem if you contain yourself. Obviously today you don't need to do stuff like this, but the point being is, is that uh, it's important for a person to know that uh, especially when it comes to defecation, uh, if a person has to defecate, uh, usually it's not something that they can hold on uh, you know, for a long time, for, for hours. Usually it's something you need to do, uh, which means that if you have the feeling, you have to go. You have to go. Uh, now, sometimes uh, you know, a person can hold themselves as far as from urinating for, you know, for even uh, you know, uh, more than an hour, hours even. Uh, but uh, you know, the other part is usually more difficult. Either way, it's never a good idea to, to contain yourself. So if a person uh needs to go they should go not contain themselves and not contain themselves because that uh it's not just physical filth it's spiritual filth that needs to be relieved because a person needs to uh you know uh, be clean uh now there are sometimes people that have uh intestinal issues uh and different types of uh digestive issues and this different types of problems where they have to they have something like crohn's or they have um, some type of malabsorption, or they have some type of condition where they have to go to the bathroom constantly. This can be a very difficult uh, problem, uh, not just because of the obvious inconvenience and uh, headache and pain and agony, uh, but also they have to also make sure that they're uh, uh, more careful with cleanliness uh, than the average person. So they have to, you know, uh, be very careful with you know making sure that they're uh, never abandoning themselves to the point where they care less whether they are clean or not. Uh, so you know it's it's a little bit uh, uh, more difficult or a lot more difficult. And that's why the Gemara says one of the people that uh, gets their suffering in this world and doesn't suffer the punishment in Gainom is a person with intestinal problems. Uh, and in, you know interestingly enough, many great sages and chachamim and tzaddikim had intestinal problems uh now intestinal problems doesn't mean uh that a person is righteous it just there's a very common denominator among some tzaddikim that uh, they had intestinal issues like uh rabbi udanasi uh was very well known and you know that tzaddikim had intestinal issues Is it permitted to subscribe to a product on Amazon in order to get a 5% discount and then cancel the subscription after it comes without any actual intention to keep the subscription? Uh, I mean, as far as the, uh, you know, the, the terms and conditions allow you to do this, meaning that Amazon is already taken into account that some people will do just that, uh, that they will... Uh, uh, buy something uh, in, in a form of subscribing to it in order to save some money, but will cancel the subscription along the way and not be the ideal customer that stays with the subscription for you know a long period of time. So they're already taking that into account and they're willing to take that risk. Uh, and I can assure you that they're making that money back up, uh, you know, many times fold in different ways. Uh, so yes, you can do it without a problem. Uh, because again, they are uh, allowing it to happen. Uh, they're not uh, forcing anyone to uh, commit to a year subscription or something like that. So you're allowed to do it. Uh, but if it, when it comes to people, uh, don't think that you're allowed to do similar things with people, meaning that you tell somebody, listen, if you give me a discount on this purchase, uh, let's say you, he sells you on a car, uh, he said, listen, if you give me a discount on the car, then uh, I'll come back to you next week and, or next month and I'll buy two more cars from you. And you know you're not going to buy two more cars. You don't even have anybody to buy two more cars for or the money to buy two more cars. That you're not allowed to do. That's called gnevada dat. 
Kineva dat is stealing somebody's mind. So you're not allowed to do things like that. Uh, but uh, as far as with uh, things like Amazon, where the terms and the conditions are, you know, public knowledge, and it's a, they are taking that into account, there's no problem with it whatsoever. Is it permitted for a Jew to change their minhag? So if a Sephardi wants to be Ashkenazi, uh, can they switch and vice versa? Uh, so as far as changing a minhag, a person should not change their minhag if it's really a minhag that they already their parents had. Uh, the, there's a verse in the Torah uh, that uh, says, Shema uh, beni musar avicha v'al titosh Torah imecha. Here, uh, uh, my son, the, uh, the, the teachings of your father and uh, uh, um, don't forsake the teachings of your mother. So the sages say that you know, this is also referring to the customs. A person should not abandon the customs uh, you know, of, of his forefathers. So if you grew up in a uh, Jewish household that uh, you know, was, a, let's say, for example, uh, you know, dressed a certain way or acted a certain way or did certain things, uh, you know, then again, if it's something superficial, such as, you know, they wear a certain hat or they wear certain shoes or they uh, have a certain uh, food in their house on, uh, on, on this particular day, those things are not uh, something you're obligated to, uh, uh, you know, to, to observe if you don't like it or if it's uh, bad for you or something like that. But something like the actual tr- entire traditions of being Sephardi or Ashkenazi that obviously is much, much more significant because that has major ramifications as far as alachas. There's specific differences uh, in alacha for, for Ashkenazi and Sephardi, when, you know, where for one, uh, you know, could, uh, could be eating something that it's 100% kosher, whereas the other one, according to them, it's death penalty. Uh, you know, so, so it's a very big difference in some cases. Like uh, the issues, uh, biggest issues I would say is in, during Pesach. So a person should not abandon uh their tradition if they have a tradition but if a person is uh you know comes from a uh you know a family that was completely secular already for their whole life and even before them a couple of generations meaning they really don't have a tradition you know their parents were secular jews their grandparents were secular they're already you know been secular There's, there has been no tradition no one has been connected they're the first person to be connected to judaism in probably uh, 50 100 years if not more then that person certainly uh, has much easier time uh, changing something as significant as going from being Ashkenazi to being Sephardi or vice versa. And we've advised certain people to do just that. Where I have certain students that uh, were uh, born one way, but were more inclined to be the other. Usually it was Ashkenazim that were more inclined and interested in being Sephardim. Uh, it happened otherwise also, but, uh, but much more, less frequent. So this does happen and it's allowed as long as the person, number one, again, doesn't come from a, uh, you know, longstanding traditions that actually, uh, and two, this is a one time thing, meaning they're not allowed to go back and forth. So even if somebody, uh, takes advantage of the, of the leniency that allows them to go from being, let's say, Ashkenazi to Sephardi. Uh, they can't go back to being Ashkenazi. You know, they can't go back and forth. You can't be, let's say, for example, you know, Ashkenazi the whole year except Pesach. That's not allowed. That the Gemara in Masechet uh, uh, Rosh Hashanah, page 14, says, Rashahu, he's wicked. Wicked such a person. The, uh, the Kula de Bet Shammai, the Kula de Bet Hillel, Rashahu. If he looks for the leniencies of both Bet Shammai and uh, uh, Bet Hillel, he's considered a wicked person. Page 14a. So that's not allowed. But if it's a once in a lifetime thing, then again, there's, there's more, uh, more a person can, uh, can do. Is it better to use handmade matzahs or square uh, machine made matzahs on Pesach? Um, I worked in a Hasidish matzah bakery years ago. I can testify it's not Mehudal line, uh, people think. Uh, again, different people, different things. Uh, not all companies are the same. 
uh, you can't say that just because you worked for one company that was not good, that makes everybody else not good, or just because you worked for one company that is good, doesn't make everybody else not good. That's uh, Lashon Ara and a lot of people and can get you into a lot of trouble. Uh, generally speaking, it's uh, certainly better to get the things that are more mehudal. Uh, this is uh, for multiple reasons. Many Chachamim say that the uh, 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 machine ma- matzah is not even uh, considered matzah. Uh, and, uh, and in fact, uh, many Chachamim make their own matzah. Uh, you know, there's a mitzvah to make matzah on the day of Pesach uh, to fulfill the mitzvah. But either way, there's many Chachamim that don't even consider the square matzah as even matzah. Uh, it's kosher for Pesach, but it's not matzah. So, uh, so it's certainly better to have the meudal matzah, uh, you know, which, uh, again, there are also different types of meudal. If you have lost all of your faith in the uh, uh, meudal matzah, uh, that's uh, the circle matzah, uh, then uh, instead of going to the, uh, for the seder itself, I still would not uh, say that you should go to the machine matzah, but rather either get uh, a different meudal matzah that's a circle, or just go to what's called ftera. The ftera is the soft matzah from the Yemenites. And uh, I believe there is no one on earth today that will dispute that that's the best matzah as far as kashrut is concerned, according to all opinions. Even though it's literally, uh, if you make it the right way, it's almost like having pita. Uh, as far as matzah is concerned, it's the most kosher matzah. It's the uh, most, uh, uh, you know, if it's a, uh, it's not easy to get. It's not cheap either. Uh, and not everybody, you know, even someone who knows how to make it doesn't necessarily mean that they know how to make it where it can taste good. But if you have uh, one from like the one that Rav Gidon Ben Moshe makes in Israel, uh, it's, uh, you know, it's very unique. Whereas other ones have had a lot of difficulties with, with that matzah. I gave up on it. But I still, again, as far as kashrut is concerned, the Yemenite matzah is by far the, uh, the best one. Uh, as far as a, uh, um, you know, taste, everybody has their own different taste. Uh, but uh, I would not go to machine matzah for the seder. For the rest of Pesach, you can have whatever you want. Uh, the machine matzah, the circle matzah, the ftera, whatever you want. But for the seder itself, uh, which uh, for, the, you know, for everyone around the world, it's two days, uh, except Israel. Uh, that's uh, that you should have a um, you should have a something much more dull. and don't cancel out everybody just because you had a bad experience with one company it's just simply a bad uh, way to look at things am I familiar with the Israelite board of rabbis Israelite board of rabbis no I'm not familiar with the Israelite board of rabbis um, no Is it permitted for a man to wear a wedding ring, or is it a woman's garment? Uh, it's allowed for a man to wear a woman to, to wear a ring, but it's not something that is, um, you know, recommended. Allowed but not recommended. You're not going to find uh, a big talmid chacham uh, wearing a wedding ring. It's it's really more of a uh, American thing. Not not among the Torah scholars, among just regular people. It's not, it's not something that Talmidei uh, Chachamim do. So if a person is trying to emulate Talmidei uh, Chachamim, they're not going to wear a wedding ring. If they're trying to emulate the Goim and be like, a, I don't know, uh, somebody that uh, could blend into uh, you know any society, then yeah, they may very well wear a wedding ring and, and uh, do all types of things. What if you have to use the bathroom in the morning, but have to do not you let your dime? Do you wash your hands without blessing first? If you must go, then you go to the go. You relieve yourself first, and then you wash your hands after you relieve yourself. Uh, let's see, there's only one question left uh, regarding eliminating the bad immediately and doing uh, good slowly. How can a person do? All the steps of tshuva for all the sins at the same time. It's not possible for a person to do all the steps of tshuva all at the same time because it requires knowledge. And knowledge is not something that they could acquire in one second. Uh, it's something that you acquire over time. So that takes time. 
Uh, can a person become a Nazir today? Can they become a Nazir today? Yeah, they could also become a Pikachu today. They can become uh, a lot of things today. Today, a person can uh, do whatever they want. They could tell you, well, listen, I was uh, born a man, but I decided that I'm a woman. I was born a woman, I decided that I'm a man. A person could, you know, today, a person can decide that he's a wall or a table or a microphone. You know, he could decide whatever he wants. But as far as if you're talking about if a person that's uh, trying to get, connect to Hashem, uh, can they become a Nazil? Why? For what? Well, how, is he gonna, how is he going to get out of it without a Bet HaMikdash? So no. So that's not something that a person can do. Uh, but if a person wants to simply do something that looks cool, uh, you know, that he's going to tell people, yo, I'm a Nazir, man. You know, then that, then you could, I, w- I would recommend for him to wear a different costume. My personal recommendation, he should go online, buy Pikachu costume, and just wear it every day. He could be yellow Pikachu all year round, and he could even put payas on it if he wants to look Jewish. Uh, so he's already pretending, might as well pretend, you know, pretend all the way. Pikachu had powers, you know, he's like, uh, from what I hear, he's, he's, he beats people up, he's, he's good. So I don't hear about any of the Nazirs beating people up. So since you're already pretending, pretend the whole way. But if he's looking to serve Hashem, what does he need to be a Nazir for? Be righteous, learn Gemara, learn the, uh, you know, the, the, the Chachamim, Poskim, learn Chumash, learn Shulchan Aruch, learn Torah. What's the Nazir? People are always about the exterior. Exterior, they want to do this, want to do that. Who needs that stuff? Just do what Torah says, do what Chachamim Israel say. Do you see any Chachamim Israel? Uh, do it. You see any the the uh, uh, you know the Admo mi, mi Bobov or the or from from Tzans or from uh, uh, any of the major Hasidut or any of the Sephardic uh, Chachamim or Ashkenazi Chachamim becoming Nazir anywhere? No. Only cuckoos on the internet do stuff like that. So, uh, follow Chachmei Israel. Follow great sages of Am Israel. Don't follow uh, what sounds cool. Okay. Oh. All right. Are yeah. uh, all modern weapons considered a, gar- a men's garment? Can women learn to use a gun if she lives alone? Should, um, who's going to teach how to use a gun? Another woman or another man? Uh, so that's, uh, that's the question. Number two, she should get married. Uh, and uh, number three, it's, uh, I don't think that uh, gun is the right approach. I think Amuna is the right approach. Praying to Hashem is the right approach. Can a woman shoot a gun? Yeah, a woman can shoot a gun. A woman can... Uh, kill if she has to we have several women that are uh you know used weapons in order to uh save am israel you have uh, yael uh that uh killed uh Cicera in a horrific way uh you know so obviously they didn't kill him with uh, poison they killed him with swords you know they chopped his head off uh, and this happened multiple times throughout history so yeah women can uh use a weapon if it's to protect ourself um but, uh, you know, as far as to get training and things like that, you have to be careful that you're not being trained by another man. You're not doing things that are immodest. Uh, but as far as to train to save your life, sure, sure. But, you know, the bigger question is, why do you live in a place that you think you need to have a gun? You know, perhaps you should move, move to a different place. Uh, there's a rabbi in, uh, in Israel that's that. Okay, like I said, Gdolei Yisrael. Don't listen to individual crazy people. There's everywhere. Uh, Gdolei Yisrael. Gdolei Yisrael are not, uh, not, uh, not in the Zilim. Not now and uh, not any time in recent history. Crazy people, there's always been. Crazy people, you could go look at the um, uh, Shulchan Aruch. Um, Shulchan Aruch. Shukhan Aru Choshe Mishpat.
שולחן ערוך חושן משפט, go to uh, כל הלכות עדות, הלכות עדות סימן ל"ה, סימן ל"ה, עוד ח', ט', י', it goes into the uh, details of what's a שוטה, crazy person, drunk, so I can assure you that person fits the description, perfect, שולחן ערוך, הלכות עדות אצל נחושי משפט, הלכות עדות, סימן ל"ה, אות י', especially, um, that so-called rabbi will fit the description of a crazy person perfectly, like a glove. Okay, tzadikim v'tzadikot, Hashem bless you with all of the blessings of the Torah to give you the strength and the wherewithal to fulfill the entire Torah. to help us publicize the Torah in every corner of the world, to continue fighting the shekel that's out there, whether it's on the on- online or face-to-face. Bezat Hashem to bring the light of HaKadosh Baruch Hu to the world. And Bezat uh, Hashem for anyone that is uh, interested and able to help us, uh, not just by donating money, but also with their skills. If you have a technical ability, Uh, you know how to code, please contact us. We were looking for some volunteers and even people for pay. If, you're, if you have the skill set, we're, we're happy to work with you. But also we're looking for people that are able to um, uh, translate, translate in different languages. Uh, right now specifically we're looking for someone in uh, Russian uh, to put more subtitles. Our Russian channel Boko Hashem is growing and the team is growing and we're looking to do even more. So anyone that has the ability to translate things in different languages and the time and the ability, please contact us and if you're interested in being one of the volunteers. And of course, anyone that uh, wants to volunteer in different ways, whether it's your services or your abilities, all of those things are certainly valuable at different times. Hashem bless you with the blessings of the Torah and Bezat Hashem will uh, learn again uh, next week. Kol Tuf.